This week, we're playing CSI, but not to murder. It's a cable mystery. Don't hang up that phone. We've found what you're looking for. Welcome to the Let's Talk Cabling Podcast with Chuck Bowser, RCDD. Well, seeing how we're pulling Category 6A, the most powerful twisted pair in the world. you got to ask yourself this one question. Did I pull 295 or 300 feet? Well, do you feel lucky? Do you punk? In this podcast, you'll learn the differences between a 66 and 110 punch tool, the proper way to install a support cable, along with testing and certifying the cable. What exactly does RCDD stand for? Registered Communications Distribution Designer. Just the expert, you need to ensure your cable plant performs exactly as designed. The elite professional, knowledgeable, and experienced in leading edge ICT design principles. So join us as we talk about the ever-changing world of telecommunications. From ISP to OSP, from copper to fiber, design to installation. Now, send the new guy to the truck for a bucket of dial tone and the cable stretchers while you listen to an informative program on telecommunications. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions that are submitted by installers, project managers, estimators, IT personnel, and customers. On this show, we connect at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this podcast on YouTube and you like the content, would you mind please hitting the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new shows are being published? If you're listening to this podcast audio on one of the podcast platforms, would you mind consider leaving us a rating, hopefully a five-star rating? Both of these steps help us take on the algorithm so we can Get this message out to more people so we can help encourage, educate, and enrich the lives of even more people. Also, don't forget our After Hours Live series on Thursday nights, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where you can submit your questions to be answered by your favorite RCDD, that would be me, on LinkedIn and YouTube. If you missed the live broadcast, that's okay. They are recorded for later consumption. Now, if you send the questions to me ahead of time, you get preference. So make sure you send those questions to questions at letstalkcabling.com. Also, make sure to check out our webpage and you'll find out all of our recorded podcasts, vlogs, and articles. You can also sign up for our newsletter and also ways to help support this platform, either through becoming a Patreon member, Amazon links, or even individual donations through PayPal. So back in late July... An audience member reached out to me about a problem that they had with a couple cables that were terminated on a patch panel inside of a telecom room. They wanted to see if I knew what the issue was. He sent me a picture, and I'll put it on the YouTube video, so if you're listening to this podcast in the audio form, you're going to have to go over to YouTube to check out this picture. Now, the picture was a close-up of a backside of a patch panel that's terminated inside of a telecom room. So close, as a matter of fact, that you can only see four of the cables terminated on the back of the patch panel. Two of those four cables had what looked like a white substance leaking out of the end of the cable and appeared to have crystallized. I am not a chemical engineer. This, this cable was inside plant cable, CMP. It was a regular network drop and did not have any PoE devices attached. It was also not in an area where it was exposed to moisture. The cable, we believe was system acts, but I have not been able to verify that. Again, this was not indoor-outdoor cable. This cable had no icky pick. I was stumped. I posted on LinkedIn for help. That post drew over 15,000 views and 80 comments. People were asking questions and offering advice. I basically had to pull in two experts to help discuss, to rule out, or figure out what was the most likely causes. First, I wanted to address all of the people saying it was because of the cable pulling lubricant. So I reached out to Jake Jones from American Polywater. Jake Jones, you might recognize that name because he was a previous guest on the show. He had some insight into this issue. So many people have said that they feel that that stuff coming out of that cable was a result of cable pulling lubricant or too much cable pulling lubricant. Well, while I've used cable pulling lubricant, I am not an expert on it but I do know an expert. And I brought Jake Jones from Polywater to help us resolve this issue, at least rule out pulling lubricant. 
Jake, welcome to the show. Glad to be back, Chuck. Now I know you've seen the picture um, of the of the uh, the unidentified mystery substance. Mystery substance, yes, coming out of the cable, and you uh, you responded to on the LinkedIn post, and you seem pretty sure that it's not cable pulling lubricant. And I know you've got a that background. So what makes you think it's not cable pulling lubricant? Well, I guess but the first sign was, that, I mean, there's no evidence of it running down the outside of the cable jacket. Um, so th there's nothing there. The, the second part of it is it would be extremely unlikely that the lubricant would find its way inside the jacket and then running out the end at the connector. Um, because even if the cable jacket was worn how would the lubricant get in there and travel? Uh, it, you would need actually a suction to, uh, there would be a need to be a reason for the lubricant to get inside the jacket and mm -hmm. run through it. Um, and then just the nature of the lubricant, there's, uh, the, I mean, there's no capillary action to where it would be running down there. It's, it's just not going to flow like that. So okay, those I, were I, the first signs. I know you're way smarter than me. What's capillary oh. action? Well, it's it's almost like wicking, you know. Oh, okay. It, okay. It's, it's it's not flowing down through that. Um, the viscosity is too high, even on lower viscosity products. It's not going to be. Um, it's not going to flow because it's it's so tightly wound inside that cable jacket. So it was coming through the inside. There's no evidence on it being on the outside. Uh, and then the last part of it is there was a lot of what do we call it, unidentified mystery goo. And the amount there really comes down to the amount of residue. Lubricant is, you know, it's, it's thinner. There's a lower viscosity to it. That was like a buildup of something. Um, so uh, Chuck, I'm working from home now, so I don't have access to beautiful uh, beakers but I have actually put together a little bit of examples of like how much lubricant that right. is and how much residue that you would need. So for example, and I don't know much about this, this cable installation, whether it's even in conduit, but for, if you were pulling a, a cable in a three quarter inch conduit, and let's say you were pulling a hundred feet um, for a, a traditional lubricant, you would need a half a, a half a quart. So we're looking at about 16 ounces. So here is 16 ounces in a poly water drinking bottle of substance. So you would need about this much lubricant to go a hundred feet in a three quarter inch conduit. Now, poly water lubricants, is, you know, they tend to run between around 5% solids. So when everything evaporates out, how much residue is left behind as usually 5% or less, some of them are even much lower. But to give you an idea what 5% looks like, so I don't spill, and I had to go to the medicine cabinet. So we're gonna get you some more sponsors here, maybe by for some phar pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> but, but this is 5%, this is less than 25 milliliters of residue from that 16 ounces. So, and keep in mind, this wouldn't all find its way down to the end of that cable. This would be distributed over that hundred feet because right. it doesn't flow. It stays right. in one spot. So that uh, you have less than 25 milliliters of residue um, over a hundred feet. So the other benefit of having a lubricant again with low solids is you're not cementing that cable or in the conduit because it hasn't left something behind. I did prepare another example. Oh, I love visual aids. I apologize. This one looks a little bit like a specimen but <laughs> if, if apple if juice I, yeah if this one is your um you know 16 ounces if you take one of the other some of the other lubricants that are available on the market are a wax base which has a much higher content you're talking about a lot more um a lot more solids so again i don't think that's what's happening here either because it's too thick to flow but you are leaving more residue in the conduit that is going to glue your cable um, to your conduit to make it more difficult to get back out. Um, 
the, the last visual I brought is, you know, I, last time we spoke, there is a different lubricant that you use much less and so much lower viscosity. Um, if this is how much your, of traditional lubricant you use, uh, this, the screen one here is less than 30 milliliters. And that is, that's how much lubricant you, you would use. So for a hundred feet. So it's, there's just no way that it could happen. It, so it me, just, go so ahead. Let me ask you this, right? So you've seen the picture. Yep. So if, if, if I was to leave, if I was to get a bottle of poly water and, and pour it in a bowl and just leave it on here at my desk for however long it takes for it to evaporate, right? Yep. What would the solids remaining in my bowl look like? Uh, depends on the lubricant. Um, I mean, if it was a communications lubricant, uh, it would be almost like a whitish, thin, I, sorry, like a booger. I mean, it, 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 it's it's um, it, it, just almost like a, a, a soft substance. It's not going to be waxy. Um, right. Now there are, and some of them are such low percent solids, it'll be almost like a white powdery substance. Dep it all comes down to the type of lubricant it is, um, but it, it's not going to look like the mystery goo. Um, and again, it would take an entire quart to get something like what you have at the end of those cables. Right. And you wouldn't be able to, uh, if I had my cable there, I wouldn't be able to put it all there and keep the lubricant there for it to dry. Right. It just, it would be falling off or dripping or it, it just, you couldn't keep enough material in that spot for it to accumulate right. and, and dry. Yeah. And you, you, you brought up a very, very good point that I hadn't really thought of until you and I just talked just a few seconds ago. When you look at that picture and I'll, and, and, and for those who or, or listening in the podcast, you watch this on the vlog on, on YouTube. I'll, I'll have the picture on the thing so you can see it. That it seems to be emanating only from like one cable, not yeah, the cable one adjacent. or two cables. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's why I was, I almost wondered. I mean, you try to throw out all the options. I mean, it almost looks like it's coming from above and dripping down into that spot. Right. It, it's, it's very strange that it would be just two cables. And again, I don't know the rest of the story. I mean, we're, we're looking at a very small picture. Right. I mean, are these coming through a conduit? Are these come, are they laid in tray? Um, I, I don't know that part of the story. Uh, I just wanted to speak on the, the part of the amount of the amount of lubricant it would take to leave that residue there um, would be incredible. And it would not it's it just how it flows. It's just, it, it's just not possible. And, and it wouldn't find its way inside the cable jacket and flow either. Um, Cause there's just not enough room for it to flow. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on. I wanted to rule out cable pulling a little bit because there was, I didn't actually count the number of comments, but there were a significant number of comments that people said it was either, it was either the gel because it was outside plant cable, which it's not, you can tell by looking, it's not right. Or right. cable pulling lubricant. And, and I'm like, it's, it's not, gel because gel is not that color gel is a, no. it's a clear petroleum based kind yep. of thing and petroleum doesn't because and i'm unfortunately the guy is not has i've been responding reaching out to him he hasn't responded back yet and you can tell it looks like it's it's solid it doesn't look like it's dripping it just you know it looks like a, yeah. a stalactite or is it a stalagmite i, I don't the caves tight, it, tight tight is like this might is like this okay see i told you you were smarter than me <laughs> So it looks like it's the lag tight, you know, the kind that's dripping down from the ceiling and it solidifies. That's what it looks like. I mean, it doesn't look like a liquidy petroleum based kind of no. feel to it. No, it, it, it almost looks waxy. Um, I, 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 I'd like to see it, but um, it, I, I, I would rule out poly water and I would rule out uh, other lubricants as well. Yeah. So I, I just don't think it's, I just don't think it's, I, that's, I, I asked if it was some type of substance inside the jacket, l like a gel or some type of right. uh, powder that had reacted. Um, yeah, I, all I can speak is to the lubricant end of it. And, and that's why I brought you on. I'll talk to your and, expertise. I've got another expert coming on after you to, to address maybe something inside of the cable or the cable construction, maybe to try to figure that portion out of it. No, Cause like I said, I'm just a, I'm an old cable guy. I, I've, that's the first time I've ever seen it. And just, I want I want to know what this is. And I also understand that 
we may never know. This may be this might be up there with the JFK assassination. Yeah. Well, you know. I will uh, I, I will tune in for you know, hopefully we come to a res- resolution and uh, conclusion on it. And uh, but I'll be tuning in to see what the others have to say. Yep. I, well, I appreciate you coming by, Jake. No problem. Thanks for having me, Chuck. Thank you. Now that we ruled out cable pulling lubricant, icky pick, and indoor outdoor cable, I have one more card left up my sleeve. I called Tom Valentine from Remy Wire and Cable, and here's Tom's thoughts or insights. Okay, so we talked to Polywater. They ruled out it's not cable pulling lubricant. So I got another expert on that they think they know what this is. This expert is from a cable manufacturer, Remy, Tom Valentine. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Chuck. Thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. I always love having experts visit me on the show because I tell everybody all the time, even though I'm an RCDD, I am not an expert. There are no experts <laughs> in this industry. Matter of fact, I used to hate it when people would refer to me as an expert because that brings connotations to it, right? Yeah, so, right. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember when I first got my RCDD, I was so afraid somebody would ask me a question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate you uh, uh, leading me into the term expert as well. I've, uh, I've been in the wire and cable business long enough to, uh, up until about a, uh, maybe a year ago, thought I had seen everything until this issue had come up. So this is, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to help your viewers uh, maybe understand something about, about what they're seeing. Perfect. So this is your first time on the show. So why don't you just give the, uh, the audience the elevator pitch about you? Um, how how did you get in this industry? How long have you been in? What makes you a what makes you a sort of well what makes you a a knowledgeable person on the subject matter? Absolutely. So yeah, uh, first time on the show. I've been in the wiring cable business uh, for about twenty five years. I got into it uh, in college. Actually, uh, I was not mathematically inclined, so computer science was out of the question. Unfortunately for me, I'm not coding. But my father worked for Belden Wire and Cable for uh, almost 30 years. So uh, growing up, sitting around the dinner table, we were talking about coaxial cables and, you know, and when I was younger, category cables. And uh, from there, my career path took me to Hubble Premise Wiring, where I sold um, end-to-end connectivity solutions, physical uh, passive infrastructure. I had a stop at Hitachi Cable America as their uh, regional director in the Southeast. And I've been with Remy now for about five years as their VP of sales and manufacturing. Um, The company has been around since 1970, manufactures everything up in a little town called Florida, New York. And uh, being a privately held company, I tend to have my hands in a lot of the different bags over there at uh, at Remy. So uh, uh, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to, to talk to you and to the audience about uh, really in this situation, AOM, but uh, you know, maybe uh, anything else that comes up. Right. So it sounds to me like you live and breathe cables. I, I do. Yeah. The, uh, the wiring cable business is very incestuous. I'm sure that you've had yes, an it cable and you know, there's a lot of, Oh, my son works or my father yes. or uh, an uncle. There's uh, yes. you know, the good thing about the wiring cable business is that it's uh uh, it's very tight knit. So fortunately, you know what your everybody else is doing, but unfortunately, they know what you're what doing. You're doing. So there are yes. a lot of secrets in this business. But. And don't burn your bridges because that person that you worked for, who's working for you, might be your boss five years down the road. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, without a, a, absolutely. Doubt. So you, absolutely. Yeah. So you it's saw the business. Yeah, exactly. So you saw the picture of the cable going to the back side of that patch panel. Yes. Um, it's a system X cable inside plan. It's not gel filled. Um, I talked to Jake from Polywater. He even had some hands-on stuff to kind of show us, look, this is how much it would be. And he, the only thing he was missing was the white lab jacket. Uh, <laughs> real smart guy, way smarter than me. Uh-huh. And, he, and he ruled out it's not cable pulling lubricant. Now you think, or you know, of course we can't, we won't know definitely unless we were to get a sample of this stuff and, and do the whole um, CSI, cable CSI and send it to the lab and, and do a yeah. chemical analysis on the gas spectrometer and all that fun stuff. But just looking at the pictures, we have a good idea what it is, and you seem to have a very strong opinion on that. So what is your opinion on what that goop is coming out of that cable? Yeah, so I have seen a similar picture before, uh, actually twice before, um, uh, and it happened to be in an indoor-outdoor environment where um, uh, in a, it was a fiber optic cable, as a matter of fact, that was being run indoor and outdoor. It was a plenum-rated product, and the crystals had formed. 
And uh, one of our process engineers took a look at it and he goes, oh yeah, that's ammonium octomolybdate. And when AOM, as, it's, as we'll refer to it as in this situation, is used as a smoke suppressant, as you know, to get a rating, a listing rather, uh, with ETL or UL or whatever service you use, your cable has to pass certain criteria. One of them is flame spread and the other one is smoke density. And in order to suppress the smoke in, in, in PVC compounds, you add, in some cases, not all, in some cases, ammonium octomolybdate. And what happens from the explanation that was given to me when we had uh, seen this before, again, it wasn't our cable, it was another, it was, and I can't remember, so I'm not gonna bring it up. I don't know what the cable, whose it was. Uh, the compounder said, yes, in this case, what happens is the transition in this case from a cold to a warm environment, it could be cold to warm environment, that condensation that occurs, there's a chemical reaction that occurs when you're changing temperatures and the vapors, as they travel out the end of the cable, gather up with the AOM molecules in the cable, in the plasticizer, and they form those distributed crystalline material that is at the end of the cable that you saw. When you say change of temperature, what kind of range are we talking about? Are we talking about a 50 degree range? Or what kind of a, what kind of range? The, the installation that we were looking at was uh, it was about a it was about a 20 degree change. It was going from an exterior uh, environment, very warm, to an interior temperature controlled 72 degree ambient environment. And that's where we noticed the crystals were were forming. That was the situation when I now I don't know the situation. Uh, behind the picture that was on the post on LinkedIn for uh, Let's Talk Cabling. But I know in my, our situation, it was from a warmer to a colder environment. And it wasn't, I asked the company, I said, is this exclusive to indoor outdoor cables? And he said, no, this is exclusive to cables that are using ammonium octomolybdate as a smoke suppressant. Generally only, you would only use that product in a, uh, uh, cable that needed to have smoke suppression, right? Because when you burn PVC riser, it is hydrochloric acid. And when you burn uh, FEP or plenum rated cables, in most cases, it's hydrofluoric acid. And they, that off-gassing needs to be suppressed. So they use AOM as that, as that third-party material. Gotcha. Now, so this particular cable, when I talked to the, the person last time, it, it doesn't come from the outside to the inside. Um, but if it comes from a ceiling, an enclosed ceiling down into a controlled space like a telecom room, we, you and I both know those things are they're kept pretty cool for the equipment inside of it. So that could easily be, I would think, a 20 degree, 25 degree temperature difference between the hot interstitial space of this, this plenum rated ceiling versus the telecom room. Would you, would you think that'd be enough to trigger that? It, it, theoretically, it could. Uh, yes, especially if the cable is traveling horizontally in a plenum space across a long area and drops into a, an extremely temperature controlled environment, uh, humidity, uh, low humidity, I should say, consistent ambient temperatures 70 degrees you know and i'm again i'm not sure of the particular environmentals involved in the installation uh, but i can tell you i am 100 percent confident that the picture that i had seen previously of the aom reactive crystalline material and the picture that i saw in your post on let's talk cabling were a result of that same chemical reaction. Gotcha. So, so let me ask you this, because you're 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 a cable manufacturing expert. Yes. I'm a cable design installation expert. Um, is a company that uses AOM to for to help pass the the fire ratings and stuff. Is that indicative of a good quality manufacturer or a lesser quality manufacturer? By all means, that is a good practice. Okay. AOM is is uh, it is a to it, so we see a lot of products imported where the costs are simply unachievable 
uh, imported products. And there's only a certain number of ways in which you can, you know, it's copper, it's plastic, and it's machines and people putting all of this together. If you're cutting out AOM or whatever material you're using to suppress smoke or reduce the amount of flame spread, you are not doing the cabling industry and the technicians or the end users a service. You are eliminating a very important step. I can, I can speak from experience having lived not only here in the United States, but also over in Europe uh, for, for four years, that smoke density and the toxicity of the compounds that we use as cable manufacturers, albeit, you know, we're talking about one cable, right? Your post was one cable, but as your viewers know, cables are bundled, right. 60, 70, 80 cables in some cases. The off-gassing of that burn, if you will, is extremely life-threatening. So you must, as a, as a responsible cable manufacturer, include a smoke suppressant in your products, whether it's natural, whether it's by AOM or any other type of, of material provided by a compounder, uh, you must have that in your material in order to, to, gotcha. to keep the occupants of those buildings safe in the event of something catastrophic. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that because I spent many years as a volunteer firefighter and EMT and, and it's the number one kill of people in a building fire is smoke inhalation. And it's not the smoke that kills you. It's the toxic off gases in the smoke that kills you. Right. Correct. So, so um, do you know what some of the other compounds that manufacturers might use to, instead of AOM? Well, we use, we, in our indoor outdoor, I'm speaking from us, right? So one of the things that we do in order to, uh, to get around it is we, first of all, we certify from our compounders that, that they don't use AOM, right? So, so let's back up a minute to the, to the picture and talk about one thing that's very important. I do not know in your particular installation if it was detrimental, right? So if the crystals don't touch any of the copper contacts, or there's no exposed copper um, in the twisted pairs, then that material is just going to hang out there and look uh, like a wart, <laughs> essentially. Uh, in the situation where we had noticed it before, it was optically causing transmission issues because it was, it was, it was, I don't know, for lack of a better word, it was debilitating the refractive index of the material in the in the optical cable. It, it, had, it had made its way into the back end of a fiber optic connector and it was causing attenuation issues. Mm -hmm. Now, was it detrimental to that install? I don't know the answer to that question. It was just, maybe it was ironic or maybe it was, excuse me, not ironic, but maybe it was coincidental that the ports were having issues, happened to have that crystalline material. Uh, but the, the, the answer to your to your question is is in our fiber optic cables we use Hytrel, uh, which uh, would eliminate the need for adding AOM to the PVC in this case the low smoke PVC compound that you would typically use or or even PBT, um, and and then in our plenum rated products we our compounder does not use AOM specifically to suppress smoke. They use a, a different compound. Chemical name, I, I don't know what it is. I can, I can get that information as a follow-up, but I, I do not have that. Now, if, you, if you would, I'd, I'd appreciate that. And also, um, because you guys are almost chemical engineers, mm -hmm. could do you have any information on AOM, like maybe uh, MSDS sheets or something that maybe I can review to put in the show? I can get my hands on those for you. I don't okay. have them handy, but I can track down the MSDS sheet not only for the AOM, but I and I, I'm I'm thinking that that uh, we are utilizing AOF as our smoke suppressant. But I will I will try and provide uh, MSDS sheets for both okay. um, chemicals for your viewers to to relate. Yes. Yeah, because when I was looking at the picture during the pre-interview, you and I talked about this and you said the exact same thing that you know as long as it's not touching copper and that caused me to go back and look at the uh, I'm sorry my puppy's rambunctious uh, that caused me to go back and look at the picture again and it looks to me like that that compound is all up inside that IDC chip on that patch panel yeah so it's probably touching copper 
Yeah. Yeah. In that situation, you're probably going to run into issues as the, you know, the transmission of electrons in the case of uh, RJ45 and category interface or IDC and printed circuit boards, or in the case of optical for cable photons. Uh, at some point in time, if you are, there, there is a point in the channel or the link to where if that material does touch copper, remember, uh, copper hates chlorine. Mm -hmm. And any of these polyvinyl chloride or fluoroethylene propylene FEP, they are from, if you go back to high school and you go back to your elements and your noble gases, a lot of the, of the uh, materials that are used in the manufacturing, in the manufacturing process for twisted pair or, you know, albeit any plenum or rated cables probably contain some type of a noble gas. That's, that's how the proliferation of a uh, halogen free or low smoke zero halogen um, has, right. has kind of started to take shape. We've noticed it a lot from our European friends that come across the pond to the US and start putting up headquarters or start, start pulling in specification. You see it in a lot of European cable specs like Litza or OLAC, OFLEX or a lot of uh, uh, Hilu cable. A lot of international products have a very, they have a head start on us in terms of uh, halogen free compounds. I didn't realize you had so much international experience. Um, maybe I have to have you on as a guest to talk about the European CPR standards. Yeah, those are that gets trickier every day. Yeah, because I, 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 you know, I, I'm a U.S. guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Ninety-nine percent of my stuff I'm teaching the U.S. But a year or so ago, I got sent over to England to teach a class, and they wanted to make sure I covered CPR. So I was in back <laughs> research mode trying to figure this all out. And and uh, and even though even though probably the majority of my audience is the U.S., I do have listeners. I was looking at my my results from my podcast, and I've got listeners in Spain and and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and stuff like that. So I got to think outside of the U.S. Yeah. So maybe I need to have you on as a guest to talk about CPR and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that depends on where you are in Europe. You know, even in England, the uh, the different parts of the of the uh, of the of the island they they have different requirements for which subscript of CPR they follow and then you get into the European you get into Germany and you get into the different factions and their their different requirements it's it's very very tricky and it's getting harder not easier to navigate ironically <laughs> yeah one of the things I do, I do remember this is not related to the AOM but I do remember when I was looking at the CPR I, I, I was I was like wow, they're they are way more advanced in their in their in their standards than we are in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, they're way ahead of us, way ahead of us. So yeah, we do a lot at Remy Wire and Cable. We do copper and fiber, as I've alluded to. We do a lot. We spend a lot of time with copper in the subway tunnels for the New York Transit Authority, and uh, there's a lot of European influence in their specifications. Uh, their single conductor circuits are XLPE crosslink polyethylene with low smoke zero halogen as the base. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we do a lot, a lot of low smoke zero halogen um, category cable as well as uh, mm -hmm. uh, communication cables for anything from intercoms to um, track controllers, positive train controllers. Um, you know, we don't touch all of those different uh, um, cables that are used down in subway tunnels. But again, you have any uh, tra tra uh, cruise liners. I know there's not, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not with it in terms of where we are with cruising again, um, but you have a confined space. You have a large amount of people. Mm -hmm. Your history as a fire volunteer, volunteer firefighter man will tell you is- Limited means of egress. Off, <laughs> off gassing. You are not going to, it is not a candle wick that you're worried about. It is the density of smoke and how right. fast it will collapse the usable oxygen yep. in a confined space. So yes, we, yep. uh, we have a lot of experience with, uh, with working our way through the most technical of engineers or the most layman of engineers right. and helping them, helping them figure out what's the best solution. <clears throat> yeah, you know, a lot of people don't realize they, they, they a lot of people know the number one cause of death in a building fire, but the number two cause of death in a building fire is an injury caused because of uh, too much smoke in the building. They couldn't see where they were going and they and they tripped and fell down the steps and broke their neck. Well, they, they died from a broken neck, but they got their broken neck as a result of there's too much smoke. That's why smoke opacity is such a is one of the critical measurements 
when yeah. it comes to to um, certifying whether something's fireproof or not. So yeah, we yeah. get, and it's not just us because our our results are going to be considered biased, right? As a right. cable manufacturer, but as as someone who manufactures old copper and fiber optic cable in New York, we always keep our eyes on what's coming in from our partner. You know, our our partners, our uh, our uh, our our uh, uh, other countries. Mm -hmm. And we we see it a lot. If if you you can you know as a you you're around a lot of technicians, they recognize that when the yep it's a great cost effective cable, but uh, it is cost effective for a reason. And the the one reason that you you don't want to have you don't want to sacrifice is lack of proper materials for the safety of the occupants. It's a life safety right. situation. And these cables, not only do they not pass the smoke density or the oxygen index as it's known in, in the labs, they don't pass it by a mile. And in a lot of cases, the flame spread on the product is, if you remember that Christmas vacation episode, or excuse me, movie where Chevy Chase's Christmas tree that it just lit up instantly. That's yep. what these cables that are using um, poor quality compounds, uh, no type of smoke suppressant, no flame retardant material. Uh, and they're just, they're, they're literally counterfeiting stamps. It's a big issue. And I know that we're trying to deal with it one day at a time. Um, but it's, it, it, it does get complicated when a good quality manufacturer like a Remy or a System X or a, or a Burke Tech gets thrown into the same mix by a, one of our certified installers as, well, why can't I use this guy right here? It's gonna save me this amount of money. Well, it's only gonna save you that amount of money because somebody's not paying attention to what right. the reality of the situation is once you install it. So right. it's, it's something that I'm very passionate about. Cool. losing. I don't mind, or excuse me, I don't mind getting beat. <laughs> I don't like losing for reasons that are uh, uh, that uh, that are not uh, appropriate. Right. Well, Tom, I appreciate having you on the show. I appreciate your input, and we'll, we're going to have you back on as a guest to talk about CPR. I'd love to. Uh, I appreciate you having me on, um, and uh, and hopefully your your viewers and uh, and listeners learned a little something as a result of this conversation. And if they'd like to reach out, I, I uh, uh, they can, they can, uh, I'm sure get a hold of me through some type of a channel that you can provide. Yeah, I, I'll put your uh, your uh, uh, your email if it's okay. I'll put your email yeah. in the description on the podcast and also on the uh, on the YouTube video as well. So that way, if they want to get in touch with you, they know how to get in touch with you. Absolutely. Or www.remy.com. You can ask an expert. You can request uh, a variety of information through any of our links on our website. Perfect. I appreciate your time, Tom. Thanks, Chuck. So the most likely cause is AOM, as Tom mentioned. But I feel I have to add that without getting a sample of this material and sending it to the labs to be analyzed, we will not definitively know what this is. I talked to one of our cable engineers as well, and they are in agreement that the most likely cause is AOM. Just like many other things in our life, we may never know the truth here. I will keep you posted if anything changes on this subject. So until next time, be safe. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.